Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Tools on Tuesday, where we shine light on the weird, the wacky, the lesser known tools of science. My name is Jacqueline from Telespark Science Center. Everyone, get your questions ready because we are going to take a trip to a very deep part of the world with the help of our tool of the week, the hydrophone. What's a hydrophone? Well, lucky for you, we have a special guest. His name is Dr. Dennis Higgs, coming all the way from the University of Windsor to chat about his research studies and singing fishes. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Dennis Higgs. Hello. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'd like to be included in the weird part of things, so it's nice to be here. Hello, welcome, welcome. We're very excited to host you, Dennis. Why don't you tell everyone where you are right now? I am currently just outside of Windsor in a small town called Harrow. And for those geographically challenged, we're at the such the edge of Ontario by Detroit. Very nice. Well, we're very excited to have you here and to host you. Our audience is curious about you. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your research studies and what you, your students and collaborators are working on? Well, we're, what all of us are interested in is how fish sense the environment around them, how they get information from the environment. And last few years, we've been focusing on how fish use sound, how they hear sound, how they respond to sound, and how they make sense of the whole aquatic realm using sound and other sensory systems too. And there's a tool, your favorite tool, that helps you do all of this. It's the hydrophone. You've got it with you. Let's do the big unveil. Let's see the hydrophone. We do indeed. This is the business end of a hydrophone. It's an underwater microphone. So just like the microphone I'm speaking into, it will shake in response to sound and fish calls. It'll pick up those calls and transmit them to something small, sort of recorder like this. We'll get the sound on the hydrophone and then we'll save them basically on a small handheld recorder and then bring them into the computer to analyze them. So the hydrophone, it's capturing the sounds from underneath the waters, something called fish calls. What are fish calls and what species are you recording? Fish calls are just like bird calls, or maybe not as pretty. They <laughs> are sounds emitted by a fish for a particular reason. And we record them and then analyze, trying to figure out what they mean. We've done this for a, a bunch of fish, both locally and in the oceans. Many, many, many species of fish make calls, but not all of them do that we know of yet. And you, you told me something interesting about fish calls um, in our conversation prior to the live. They only make sounds at certain times, or you phrased it as when they're in the mood. Can you elaborate on that? So they, they won't make a call without a purpose. And so a lot of the calls are for mating. So if it's mating season, they get that look in their eye, they see just the right <laughs> female fish swimming by, they will make calls to attract other fish to them for mating. If they're pissed off at a fish, another fish, they're fighting for area, they'll make calls against each other, sort of arguing back and forth. When they're swimming around, most of them won't make any calls unless they have a real reason to make them. So it really is a conscious effort on the fish to say, hey, I'm here, either come to me or get the hell away from me. Okay, so they make calls for mating. They make calls to communicate when they're angry and mm -hmm. to mark their territory. So fishes have a lot of personality, actually. They do indeed. Now, often some of them make calls when they're, when they're swimming together in a big group and they want to stay to together. They'll make calls in this group, say, here I am, here I am, here I am, follow me. <laughs> Hello, here I am. Here's yep. my pin. <laughs> yeah, lots to say. For those of you at home, um, we have some audio clippings for you so that you can hear exactly what these fishes sound like. And these recordings actually come from the hydrophone that Dr. Higgs has recorded himself. So let's give a little listen and we'll see what the fishes are really saying. Here we go. <laughs> All right, that sounds like a familiar animal. Dr. Higgs, or Dennis, sorry, uh, what, what fish is this? So that sounds like a pig, and that's because they named the fish a pig fish, because it's it sounds just like a pig. And, but it doesn't look like a pig, though, no. That, it just sounds fishy, but yeah, that, that one is a marine fish that we've recorded in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And is this a, a fish that we can find here in Canada as well? They don't come this far north. They like it a bit warmer. Oh, makes sense. So yeah, definitely not here, especially Calgary. It's freezing. Yes. <laughs> All right. Here's another audio clipping of a, a fish call. Mm -hmm. 
Let's play that one more time. That kind of sounds like a heartbeat. Yeah, it does. They'll repeat this for sort of sometimes hours and hours. And what they're doing is they're sitting on a nest. This is a male fish sitting on a nest calling out to a female. And it's a round goby. Those are in Canada, but it, that's an unfortunate story. They're not supposed to be. This okay. is a very invasive fish that got brought over accidentally from Europe. But it's taking over lots of places in Canada. So I, I heard that round gobies are really good for bait. And if they're evasive, then what's, what's the trick if we're using this as bait? They are useful for bait because a lot of the native fishes have figured out that they're a tasty fish. The problem is if you do use them for bait, make sure you do not release them. If, mm -hmm. if you have caught one in your local lake and have a bunch that you only use for bait and then go home, never release them again. It's actually illegal to possess them. It's not illegal to kill them and use them for bait, but never release any bait fish outside of where you got it from. This is good tips for our fishers. All right, here is another audio clip, a last one. Let's give this one a listen. I'm gonna play that one more time. This time, folks at home, let's listen to the low tones. You might hear, I believe it's a motorboat or a steamboat on it's top. A motorboat, yes. A motorboat, um, but let's listen to the deeper tones for the sturgeon fish. Ooh, very mysterious. Dennis, what can you tell us about this fish? What is it exactly saying? This is the lake sturgeon. And this one, again, is a reproductive sound that we recorded over a large nesting area of these fish. The male will come into an area in big groups. They will then make this call in large numbers and the females will come to them. And these fish get massive. They get many meters long. And the calls can be so intense, they can actually shake the surface of the water. So you can actually see the water shaking because you have these large, large fish making these calls. And, and these, these fish are common in Canada. They used to be um, endangered, but they're recovering now, which is a good thing. That is a very good thing. That's really good to know. So there you go, folks. We got some, some um, audio clippings or vocalizations from Dennis's hydrophone. Now I'm curious, Dennis, what made you curious about pursuing this, this, this job of yours to understand fish calls? As a kid, I was a weird kid and I always liked water. And we had a cabin in the woods and my siblings would be playing out in the woods. And I'd be floating down the river watching fish below me, not realizing that was any kind of job you could get. I just really liked watching fish because again, I liked water and swimming. I got to university, I was a bit lost. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I was supposed to go to university because that was what we did. But I really have, was really struggling through the first couple of years, not knowing why I was there until I walked into a class called Marine Ecology. And the professor was an amazing professor named Dr. Hill, who's still around. And he lit a fire under me of actually, actually make a living studying fish and fish ecology. And he took us on a field trip actually to the ocean where we did what I did as a kid. We snorkeled and watched fish, but then came up with scientific hypotheses for why the fish were doing what they were doing. And it, it was a light bulb moment for me you can get paid for watching fish, you can get paid for playing with fish. And so sort of that set me on my current sort of journey to where I am now. I love that. And, and that's what Spark is all about too. We want to inspire kids and even adults to pursue STEM careers. So I really like hearing stories like that, um, especially me personally too, pursuing a science career now as well. Um, this is all really fascinating stuff for me. You have spent a lot of time understanding fish calls, vocalizations, how they communicate. There must have been some weird noises captured. What's the most fascinating or strangest sound that you've captured with the hydrophone? That's the toughest part about doing what we're doing with the hydrophone. We often can't see what's making the sounds. And so we'll okay. put it on. We have some idea what they should sound like for some species, but you'll get all these weird sort of outer spacey calls. There was one, we're doing the sturgeon. We kept hearing this whoop, whoop. <laughs> we still have no idea what it was. We tried to track it down. And that's some of the stuff you can recognize. Then you'll get these weird calls. It could be another fish. It could be a frog. It could be an alien. We just don't know. Yeah, it's really, I actually read somewhere, um, I don't know if it's true, so correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, uh, I read somewhere that it said we only know about 5% of what's actually in the ocean, which means there's another 95% left to be discovered, and it's interesting that the hydrophone could potentially capture 
an unknown species that we've never seen or, or heard of before. It certainly can. It can be difficult then to figure out what that is. But the nice thing about it is we've, me and, my, and many, many others um, using the hydrophone can find new spots where fish are spawning. So we can use it to say, we, where are fish mating? The, the motion's a huge place. You can put these things out and then find out, oh, they're spawning over here. We can't see them. And it can work mm -hmm. at a much further distance than the visual stuff. So it's, it's fun that way because you can find out new things that you couldn't find any other way. But it's frustrating you have lots of unknowns as well. That's true. Yeah, I actually have a question about that. So how do you know where to place a hydrophone? Because in my head, me not knowing anything about fish or hydrophones, I'm thinking it like a fishing rod where you just throw it somewhere and wait. For some of our hydrophones, that's true. Like the one I, this one is one that you just throw out there and you're, you're with it with a recorder. Other ones we have are encased in a big pipe that you can put out for months at a time and come back and collect. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is either we know that there's a spawning reef nearby. So we know already from visual surveys that like the sturgeon, we know where they're having sex or we want to discover likely spots. We deploy multiple hydrophones in obvious areas that we think this seems like a good substrate often we'll come back with sound sometimes we'll come back without sound so it's a bit of an educated guess in many many places gotcha we have some questions coming in so folks at home if you have questions for dr dennis higgs make sure you put it in the comments and i'll share them with dennis we're taking them in from facebook and youtube we've got a question here and it says can two separate species understand one another what has your research studies say in some cases, yes. If it's a mating call, then the two species won't, won't respond to each other. So they won't come looking for sex from another species. But we have played back some mating calls in the field and predator fish have a whole different species to come and will strike the speaker. So they can hear these calls and say, ah, there's food over there. They're not, they may not know what it means, but they can use it to find other species. So they can definitely hear them. So sorry, did you say that you play the bait calls with the hydrophone? We, yeah, we can play them back and we have a bunch of underwater speakers as well. And we can play the sounds directly from the speakers or you can play it back from the hydrophones. And you'll see fish will come to it and check it out, especially predators will come and sort of peck at it thinking they found an easy meal. Yeah, I'm envisioning this in my head and I keep thinking it, you must have lost a hydrophone. These fishes must have taken the bait quite literally. The fishes haven't stolen it, but we have lost them because we'll put them in places with a lot of current. And especially these ones that we have to deploy for months at a time, we've lost. Now we've lost two. I was going to blame my students, but actually I lost the first one <laughs> because the current, just, if they're not properly secure, the currents will take them away. I, um, I remember going to aquariums as a little girl and um, walking through the fish tanks. There were always signs that says that says something like don't tap the glass. You mm -hmm. see that pet stores as well. What's the science behind that? What's actually happening to the fishes? Two things are happening. That, that tap on the glass like that can be a large, like a shock wave through the water. So it can be a large sound going through it can scare them. Fish mm -hmm. also have a series of re receptors on their side called lateral line that directly detect vibrations. So if you, if you um, tap on that glass, it'll send these vibrations out, which then also will stress the fish out. So that's how fishes hear is through the lateral. No, they, hear, they hear through the ear, which is inside the head. So if you look at a fish, you, can't, you don't see the ear, but they've also got extra receptors on the outside, the lateral line. And that's, that's sort of how they feel. So they'll hear in the ear and they'll feel movements with the lateral line. Gotcha, through the sound vibrations. You actually have a round goby too. Are you able to show us um, the, how they hear via the round goby? So this is the actual round goby. I scared my wife at lunch because it was in my fridge, but I brought it home. <laughs> this is a fish scientist too, it's okay. And you can probably see these stripes on the side of the head, I think. Okay. Those are actually these lines of lateral line receptors on the outside. And so it, again, it, if I can get it focused, these stripes here that you might better see the little dark stripes and there's stripes along the side. Those are lateral line receptors. And then the ear itself, you cannot see. It'd be situated inside the fish roughly there and sound has to pass through the flesh of the fish and then move that ear cell itself. So unlike us, we have an external ear hole that sound travels through to get to our ear. In the fish, it actually goes through the body of the fish and then shakes the ear. 
That is really fascinating. I don't know why, but I've never ever even pictured or wondered if fishes have ears before. So this is really interesting. We're getting some questions in um, via Facebook as well. Colleen asks, can fish give warning sounds? They can give warning sounds and uh, that pig fish that you heard, what it was saying was let me go you idiot because I picked it up and recorded it. Oh. And they give warning sounds um, to warn off predators. There's some evidence that actually other fish might respond to those sounds. And then when fish A makes a sound that a predator is going to come eat me, the rest of the fish at school may well scatter. Gotcha. Well, there you go, Colleen. Yes, they do give warning sounds. Aaron asks, do baby fish make sounds to communicate, communicate to or only adult fish? So far, it seems to be adult fish because to make sounds, they need what's called a swim bladder, which is a bubble of air inside the fish. There's other ways to do it, but that's the common way. And baby fish don't have those, but baby fish will respond to sounds. And they'll actually on the coral reef stuff we did, the baby fish have to find the reef to settle on. And mm -hmm. we and others have shown that actually the baby fish will be listening for adult fish. And they'll swim towards those sounds saying, oh, that must be a safe place for me to go. So they don't make them, but they do respond to them. Mm, that, is, that is really interesting. So tell me more about the coral reefs. There's a lot of activity that's happening there. Why is that? So coral reefs are incredibly noisy places because they're full of animals of all types, both fish and invertebrates. Coral reefs are a really good place to study fish because they're usually big structures surrounded by open water. It's like structure because food settles on the structure and there's lots of hiding places in a coral reef for smaller fish. So there's sort of a magnet for fish to live on. So as we hear about coral reefs bleaching and dying, it extends out beyond the, the coral itself to affect the fish because it's a good place to, to eat. It's a good place to hide. Any place with structure tends to attract a lot of animals. And these animals are extremely noisy. Mm -hmm. So we need coral reefs. Is we there anything that reefs. we can do right now to protect the coral reefs? A lot of the problem with reefs is, you may have heard about coral bleaching, and that's due to water temperatures increasing. And coral reefs are colored because they have algae inside the corals that work together. And this warm water tends to make them expel the algae. So the best thing to do is do all you can to combat climate change. There's a lot of um, organizations that are trying to restart the coral reefs. There's an organization from Canada called For the Reef, where they basically plant new baby reefs, various places, in hopes that they grow. I'm learning so much today with you, Dennis. And Actually, if I can stop, one other thing people can do directly, if you go on vacation at a coral reef and you're getting sunscreen, because we're, we're pasty Canadians, many of us, they get burned, I certainly, I certainly do. <laughs> If you want sunscreen, there's actually reef safe sunscreen you can buy specifically. So those chemicals when you swim, when you're snorkeling for the fishies, won't damage the reefs. This is really good information, especially for me living in Calgary. It's such a dry place. I don't often encounter fishes or coral reefs. So for those of you at home, we're getting some good tips for our next vacation when it's safe to do it's so. Allowable. Yeah. Um, Let's talk more about the hydrophone. Um, is there anything that you're hoping the hydrophone can discover or, or tell me more about your research and what, what the hydrophone can do for you? What we're doing with it is a couple things. We do basic research on understanding why fish make sounds and what mm -hmm. they might mean. We're also very interested and worried about what's called anthropogenic noise and that's man-made noise. Mm -hmm. More and more information that man-made noise, motorboats, construction, building a bridge, making pilings, can actually damage fish hearing and cause stress. So a big part of our research now is trying to figure out, is that causing a stress? How, and it is, um, and maybe how can we reduce that stress? So a, a colleague of mine in New Zealand lives next to a marine reserve and actually they ban all boats completely from that reserve because mm -hmm. it does stress the fish out. Yeah, so there's a lot more research to be done around that as well. And I'm curious about the cells inside of the, the mm -hmm. fish's ears. Um, how different is that from a human's ear? Do they regenerate the cells or is the long-term effect of man-made noises forever? The neat thing about fish is they have at the cellular level the same cells we have to respond to sound. And when we lose our hearing, so as we get older, we start losing higher frequency hearing, those cells are actually dying and we're just done. Fish can actually regenerate throughout their life. So if they get damaged and they then they move to the quiet, they can regenerate those cells, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. If a fish is exposed to a, a brief loud sound, it might stress it out. It might kill some cells, but then 
give it two weeks and those cells will come back. If they're kept in a constantly noisy environment, they likely won't. So lots of experiments left to be done. Yeah. Uh, we got a question here from Ava and Ava asks, what do you hope to discover with the hydrophone? Any we new hope, discoveries? We're right now working on, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking at using a hydrophone to record underwater noise in the Bahamas to try and, and we're looking at stingrays to see if underwater noise disrupts stingrays. They don't, make, they don't make their own sounds that we know of, but there seems to be a lot of noise we're looking at. How does the stingray change swimming when a boat goes by or when a, when a boat noise is presented versus a, a freighter, even airplanes, we can pick up with our hydrophones. So you've done research in Mexico, the Great Lakes in Canada, the Bahamas. What can you tell us about the difference between those places? Is there, is there any difference? There's lots of difference in terms of fish, fish diversity. Um, Canada, with the freshwater fishes, we do have a lot of them that make sounds. Um, all of them can hear sounds. In the ocean work we're doing, especially around coral reefs, even more of those fish seem to be making sounds. And it's a more diverse ecosystem. But uh, in the Canadian research we're doing, the freshwaters, it's much less understood in many ways because people want to go to the oceans and study instead of staying home. Yeah, uh, me too. I, I don't blame them. <laughs> I wouldn't complain. Uh, we have another question here coming in from YouTube. Are hydrophones all the same size or are there bigger ones for bigger fish in deeper water? They're, they're all different sizes. The one I brought home is a relatively simpler one and they have different amounts of sensitivity. So how good they are picking up sounds. You can get cheaper ones online that aren't as sensitive, but still can pick up sounds. And then some of the ones that we use for our ocean work are the hydrophone itself is a little bit bigger, but the unit that we deploy in the ocean has batteries and computer chips and things in it. So the entire thing is about a little bit bigger, not big. But the, the working unit itself is pretty similar across. You can get a bit bigger to get more sensitive. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, we have another question from YouTube from Vegas Golden Knights. And uh, they ask, what is your favorite fish, Dennis? My favorite fish, oddly enough, doesn't make sound that we know of. It's called a paddlefish. They, yeah. they get very large. But the neat thing about them is they have an, uh, basically a long extended nose, sort of a beak. On that beak, they can detect electricity. So they have a, what are called electroreceptors. Whoa. Very cool. And that's found in Canada, those fish? That is found in, those fish are found in Canada, um, especially in the Great Lakes area. They used to be more common. They used them back in the day for caviar. And so they overfished them, but they are coming back. That's good to hear, <laughs> especially since it's your favorite. Yes. Um, Jennifer also asks, uh, do you have a recording of sharks? We haven't found any sharks that make noise, but they, we do have recordings of them responding to the noise and swimming away from the noise. And what is the biggest fish you've ever recorded? That's probably the lake sturgeon. And those get a couple meters long and they can live up to 150 years. So the ones we're recording are at least probably 40 years old. The one, the, the one that we played today? Yes. That's insane. So I've they, never they, heard they, of fish calls before. So it was, it was a treat to hear such a low hum. <laughs> and um, those bigger fish tend to have lower hums too. So the really big fish have that really low, low frequency hum. Speaking of low frequency hums too, I, I know that humans, we find different sounds or looks attractive more than others. Is that the same for fishes? Do they, do they appreciate the lower hums? Even within a species, we tend to find that the bigger fish of that species have a lower hum and those seem to be more attractive. So I think the, the ladyfish seem to like the lower, deeper frequency because it tends to mean that's a bigger male. No. <laughs> And does that also mean that only the male fishes make sounds or can female fishes make sounds as well? In some species, both will make a sound. They'll kind of duet together. They'll swim up in the water column and the male will burp and the female will burp and they'll go back and forth. <laughs> Speaking of burps, Dennis, oh dear. a great segue for us because I put together a fun game for you. It is called Bubble Guts. And... Um, I'm learning so much about fishes, especially how similar and different we are from fishes, obviously. Um, but I'm growing a big appreciation and a soft spot for fish. So I wanted to share with you some recordings. Now, you've never heard of these recordings before, but um, I have some recordings of uh, human farts and fishes farts and burps. And you have to, using your expertise, let me know, is it a fish call or is it a human fart? Are you up for this game? I'm ready. Put my reputation right. on. 
those of you at home, you can play along with Dr. Dennis Higgs as well. Let me just get this set up for us. Uh, and here we go. All right, three recordings. Are you ready, Dennis? I'm ready. Here we go. Here's the first one. Let's play that one more time. It's a fish. Not human anyway. It's not human? No, that's my fish. guess. Fish, final answer, Dennis? Yes. It is a fish, you're Woo! right. Yeah, nice. This is a fish um, a recording from Maine. All right, here's the next one. <laughs> Let's play that one more time. Fish or human, Dennis? The tougher one, but I'm still gonna stick with my fish. You're gonna say fish? Yes. Final answer? You don't wanna ask the audience or call a friend? <laughs> what do you think, friend? <laughs> <laughs> She's saying fish as well. It is actually a human. Oh, <laughs> that was a tough one. I, could, I thought I could hear water in the background. So, you know, we can we can try these experiments at home too. They sound That's very right. similar to fish calls, so it could mean something to the fishes. <laughs> All right, here's the last. <laughs> a fish or a human? Fish. You're absolutely right. That is a fish. I hope everyone enjoyed that little game there. Um, I found these recordings in a, in a very fun place. Uh, the the human one I actually found on YouTube, and it's just this funny guy. He's just he's just swimming in like a recreational pool, and he brought his GoPro down and he <laughs> a couple farts, and that's how I found that video. So there you go. But it's interesting. It does sound similar. So I don't know if fishes can understand these noises or if it means anything to them but you let me know we'll try it and see if we offend the fish <laughs> <laughs> um my friends we have just a couple minutes left we have two minutes left so let's let's do two more questions sure. Dennis, what is one thing that you want to share with our audience um about the hydrophone what's one good takeaway for our audience the good takeaway is it allows us to really understand an aspect of fish that we, and the underwater world that we really didn't think about back in the, if those people that have watched Jacques Cousteau back mm -hmm. in the day, they were often told it was this island ocean. It's not as far from silence. It's been fun to discover all those diversity of sounds that are out there. I love that a lot because um, I've learned through you that there are fishes that make sounds, stingrays don't make sounds, sharks we're not sure of. There's a lot to uncover here. And I'm very excited to learn more about the hydrophone, especially because it hasn't been around for so long. Is that correct? That is correct. We didn't know fish made sound until World War II. And actually until after the war was declassified because they were trying to hunt submarines, the Navy was. And they kept hearing these burp, 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 burp. They, they didn't know what they were. It turns out they were fish. And it wasn't until after the war when those recordings were declassified that we then learned, hey, fish actually make sounds. They do. And there's a movie that you mentioned as well um, um, that has a really good story about the hydrophone too. Can you remind me what that is? Well, that's an old, old movie called The Incredible Mr. Limpet. And it has an uh, actor called Don Knotts, who the older audience members might recognize um, from Mayberry RFD, but basically the storyline is he loves fish. He ignores his wife, sorry wife, and he <laughs> falls in the ocean and becomes a fish, but then they actually use his sounds as a plot line in the movie. Well, there you go, my friends. We learned a lot about the hydrophone today. If you want to do your own experiment of the hydrophone, Dennis has something you could share um, that might, that you could do at home and recreate your own hydrophone. So yeah, my hydrophones are fairly expensive, but you can look online. I found one called Dolphin Ear, not a paid advertisement. And there's some other ones too that you can actually plug in directly to your iPhone or um, Android that you can use to drop in the water. There's actually, there are some YouTube tutorials on how to make your own hydrophone even for those that are technically gifted more than I can. But so they are accessible to the general public. Or you could dunk your head underwater. Or you could dunk your head underwater and see the comparisons. Actually, when you dunk your head underwater, when the boat comes by, you can actually hear the boat from quite a ways off.
There we go. Dennis, it has been such a joy chatting with you today. Thank you so much for itching my curiosity about hydrophones and fishes. For those of you at home, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you and can't wait to see you once we reopen, whenever that may be. Um, if you enjoyed this series, make sure you tune in next week for another episode of Tools on Tuesday. We're chatting with Dr. Katie Burney and a registered nurse to talk about needles. So oh, make exciting. sure you tune in. There we go. Thank you so much, Dennis. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.